Let me mention, uh, I, I do know that it is October of 2017. And uh, the problem is, uh, we are recording this church history series, and if we totally mess it up uh, order-wise, that's going to be a problem. But I do intend to um, spend a few hours <clears throat> on the dividing line, uh, probably starting this week, um, talking about doing some of the Reformation stuff. Um, partly, honestly, partly to provide somewhat of a counterbalance to um, uh, the fact that, in, in my humble opinion anyways, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of... Uh, imbalanced presentations regarding uh, uh, the Reformation, uh, even from those that shouldn't be doing it uh, or should know better. And uh, in my opinion, if you don't tell the whole story, uh, including all the warts and um, the politics and everything else that was involved, you end up with a cartoon uh, rather than the reality of, uh, of what took place. And so uh, I'm probably going to be uh, doing a number of hours on the Reformation. So if you sort of want, if you sort of feel like you're getting gypped because we're going to be somewhere in the medieval period, we're going to be getting close. We're not going to get to the Reformation until, uh, you know, toward the end of the year or early next year. <clears throat> um, then you might want to catch some of those programs on, uh, they're on Sermon Audio just like all our stuff is, so just a matter of going to a different, uh, different spot, and uh, you should be able to pull those up. Part of the problem uh, is so much of what is said about the Reformation uh, sort of operates on the assumption, certainly sort of the way I was raised, um, not purposefully, but just by default, that, uh, well, yesterday I, I was listening to a, a radio program, uh, a couple of you know who Chris Arnzen is. Uh, Chris arranged all those uh, what were called the great debates on Long Island we did back during the 1990s, well, late 1990s into the 2000s on the subject of Roman Catholicism. And uh, he arranged other debates on other subjects, but that particular series that we did. And uh, he is a convert from Roman Catholicism, and so... He was asked by Justin Brierley, who is the host of the unbelievable radio broadcast on Premier Christian Radio in London, uh, to be on a program where he told his story of his conversion to uh, out of Roman Catholicism and then another, another guy into Roman Catholicism, even though the guy was an Anglican, so I'm, I'm sorry, in England, I'm, that doesn't seem to me like that, that big of a jump, but anyway. Um, and in listening yesterday to uh, the resultant mini-debate that... Uh, that took place, uh, I, was, <clears throat> uh, I was reminded the, the former Protestant, quote-unquote, uh, basically said that our position is that no one knew the gospel until Luther. And I, I you know... I mean, that's a misrepresentation. If you've ever read any of Luther, you know Luther never said that. Um, and you know that the Reformers very strongly emphasized um, their connection to the early church. I started reading a book yesterday, got about halfway through it, um, uh, out of the Master's University, Master's College, Master's Seminary. Uh, anyway, um, called Long Before Luther. Uh, I knew, I'd known this was coming, but I, I wasn't able to get hold of a pre-release copy of it, but it's out now, and it's a basically an argument that the primary elements of the Reformation message on the nature of the gospel, justification by faith, um, imputation of Christ's righteousness, uh, can be found uh, long before Luther. And uh, you might want to pick it up. It's very interesting. I have it on Kindle, but I'm going to be ordering the... Uh, hard copy of it, just simply for the number of citations and quotations in it, um, uh, by Busenitz is the last, last name. Um, but uh, it, it just struck me how often, even in his book, he was quoting 
Calvin and Luther and others and their citation of the early church. So uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't pretend that they were coming up with something new. They thought they were going back to what was apostolic. And their, their, yes, their emphasis was upon the Bible first, not upon anybody else. But the idea that I was raised with basically was the medieval church was just simply purely apostate. There were no Christians. And that's not what the reformers believed. And uh, when you find, and, and here's, here's, what, here's what causes us to struggle and to think. We're going to be getting into the medieval period here. We're going to be looking at the expansion of the Western church, starting with Patrick, which actually takes us back before Islam, so we're, but we're looking at a different area. Uh, but when you find medieval writers who not only affirm that they are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and speak of the imputed righteousness of Christ, but they also believe things that we don't believe. They go beyond that. Where do you draw the line? And one of the temptations that I've had to uh, struggle with in studying church history and teaching church history, I don't consider myself a church historian. A church historian is someone who, that's, that's their field. That's what they do. That's what they read. That's, um, if, you know, I'm first and foremost an apologist, but the PhD program right now, I'm a textual critic as well. So those, those, are, those are sort of the areas that I'm reading in and reading scholarship in regularly and all the rest of that kind of stuff. But I do a lot of study, do a lot of reading in church history. And I've read hundreds of books in church history. So um, it's, a, it's an area that I'm at least familiar with. And one of the struggles that I have um, in trying to filter out the traditions of my background um, is the tendency to, to want to try to remotely judge the salvation of individuals who lived hundreds of years before me based upon my standards today and what I know today. And I've had to come to recognize I, that's not something I can do. I think there's someone much better qualified to do that, leave it in his hands. Um, but at the same time, um, we do have to you know, struggle with the issue of True church, false church, where do you draw the line, how much error is too much error. Um, and we've already talked about, you, know, you look at someone like Justin Martyr. You know, he said some things that we'd go, mm, but he probably didn't even have Paul's writings. How good would your theology be if you didn't have Paul's writings? Uh, how do you, where, do you, where do you go there? How do you handle things like that? How do you handle someone who confesses all the core truths and yet, goes beyond that to these things out here. And, and especially, you know, in our day, the lines are pretty clearly drawn. Uh, I mean, we've got, you know, the past has, has given us clear delineation of the difference between saying that grace alone and faith alone saves or faith is, in, you know, has to be infused uh, and, uh, with these good works and merits. And <clears throat> we've, we've been through all this stuff before. Yeah, we have, but how many people today have any idea? How many people today have ever read the Cans and Decrees of the Council of Trent or, or anything like that? Um, these are all things that make... Uh, it's one of the reasons that church history can be so horribly abused um, by, by people today, uh, if it's even looked at uh, at all. But the point being that so much of what we hear today just sort of has Luther just popping into existence. He didn't. Um, he came from a background. He was deeply influenced by medieval theology. Uh, he never got rid of all the influence of that medieval theology, even though he very purposefully rejected certain elements of it. Still, you are who you are. And uh, when, you, when you think of the people who were so influential in eventually directing him to peace. Uh, 
such as uh, Staupitz, um, you, just, you just wonder, uh, where were God's people during that time period? Uh, I have no question that the dude running around in Rome in armor uh, with the you know, 47 concubines wasn't one of them. Um, but were there not simple people with a simple faith in other places? Um, these are some of the issues that you deal with. And so as we talk about the expansion of the Western church and we, we uh, <clears throat> see a general uh, encroachment of tradition and sub-biblical teachings and practices, especially as we see, and what's the big term? I, I think it's a term that we need to be tracking through history as we see the rise of sacralism, the state church, the union of church and state, which (coughs) we need to remember, the Reformation is a sacral Reformation in its its, uh, magisterial form. So in other words, Luther, Zwingli, Bootser, Ocalampadius, um, Calvin, second generation, um, these were all sacral reformers. They're magisterial reformers. They are reformers of a state church. And they were all to the man opposed to a free church, um, opposed to what is unfortunately called either the Anabaptist movement or the Radical Reformation. Unfortunately, both those terms are used of such a wide variety of perspectives that uh, it, it, it boggles the mind, but they were not uh, seeking a, a free church. <clears throat> they opened the door to it. Uh, their work eventually led to it, but uh, that was still centuries in the future. <clears throat> and uh, Baptists continued to die at the hands of both Protestants and Roman Catholics uh, into the early 1800s in Europe. Um, and so this is something we have to keep in mind, and we've already sort of established the beginning of sacralism in the sense of the beginning of its development with Constantine's role at the Council of Nicaea, 325. Um, that doesn't mean that the church of 325 was a sacral church, uh, but that was just the start, and then you, you see more and more connectivity and interaction uh, until... You know, you see what Augustine did with the Donatists, remember, in allowing the, the state uh, to be involved in the, in the suppression of the Donatists, and, and that's the next step. And, and so I'd say in the West, by the 7th century, you've, you've got a pretty strong sacral situation, and the Reformation is still 800 years plus in the future at that point. And so that was the heritage of the Reformers. And where did it all come from? If we don't have the background, and most people, let's just be honest, I mean, medieval church history, please, there's a yawner. Um, but that's a big chunk of time. And if you ignore it, you really do end up with Luther as a cartoon figure with a hidden S on his chest. You know, and that's just not the way it was. And... It concerns me a lot what I'm hearing um, from a lot of folks at this time. I'm hearing a lot of cartoonish presentations about Luther and the Reformation that um, if you accept that and get all excited about that and rah, rah, here I stand, you know, and you get your Luther is my homeboy shirt and stuff like that, and and then then someone comes along and, and talks about, the role of politics and what happened in the Peasants' Revolt in 1525 and uh, how recalcitrant and, and just immature Luther was at the Marburg Colloquy and um, the fact that uh, the second to last sermon he preached in Eisleben was... was uh, it wasn't as badly anti-Semitic as it's made out to be, but, and, and it was very much in line with popular sentiment of the day, but still it was in line with popular sentiment of the day, which wasn't good. Um, 
you have all of that stuff and someone comes along and all of a sudden your heroes are not heroes anymore. And if you've connected that with the entirety of the Reformation without knowing the context, well, it's easy to get disillusioned. So this background stuff may not be, uh, you know, all that thrilling, uh, but it is necessary. It is important to recognize. And um, I, I believe Christ has always been building his church. And it's not always easy to see exactly what the borders of that always look like. Um, you know, here in the United States, we've had nice, clear lines for a long time, but this isn't the only nation on the planet. And uh, in other nations, even to this day, the lines aren't nearly as easily drawn as they are, <clears throat> as they are here. So anyway, with that background, um, we talk a little bit about the expansion of the Western church. So the church going west, and we talk about Patrick. Ah, oh, yes. Irish Christianity. Patrick, you know. Um, three, Patrick, 389 to 461. His uh, father was a deacon, a son of a priest. Uh, Patrick was kidnapped by Irish pirates at the age of 16. And he was made a, he was forced to work as a shepherd in Ireland for six years. Um, At 22, he escaped uh, to England. And after a two-month reunion with his family, uh, said he had to go back to Ireland uh, to minister to the Irish. And his memoirs end at that point. So everything else comes from tradition and stories that are told, so on and so forth. Uh, which tell us that he went to Rome to learn Latin and then went to Ireland. He uh, planted small monasteries in unpopulated areas, like on small windswept islands. And there are a few small windswept islands uh, off the coast of Ireland, I can guarantee you that. Couldn't have cost much to buy that land. (laughs) Um, not sure how you build much on a small windswept island, but anyway, that's what he did. Uh, there are many myths and legends about Patrick. Uh, he is credited with founding Celtic Christianity, or if you're in Bostic, Celtic Christianity, I guess, um, which did not have extremely close ties with Rome. Um, and so the, the Celts separ- celebrate Easter on a different day than Rome. Uh, all we know for certain is that Pat- <coughs> excuse me, is that Patrick was very missions minded, and uh, that he uh, established so many uh, missions minded areas there in, uh, in Ireland that he had a tremendous impact upon the rest of the history in that particular uh, area. <coughs> then we have someone named uh, Columba. And uh, his dates are uh, 521 to 597. Um, He's primarily known, uh, he is a Celtic Christian <coughs> who went to Scotland, where he spent 34 years ministering in Scotland and founded a monastery at Iona, which is very important in uh, the history of the faith in uh, Scotland. <coughs> and it was from Iona... And a man named Aiden came forth. Well, came forth, I'm not sure what that means, but he dies at 651. And he goes south uh, into England, and uh, he set up the monastery at Lindisfarne, 
which is an island off the east coast of England, which uh, ends up being very important in uh, <coughs> the faith there. Now, <coughs> English Christianity, uh, in the history of the Roman Church, Gregory the First, or Gregory the Great, became Pope in 591. I'm sorry, 590. Don't want to steal a year from him there. Um, he was uh, both a political as well as spiritual leader. Um, his, he is important for a lot of reasons. Um, he really, uh, he, he wrote... He, he was really far ahead of his uh, predecessors up to his time period as far as um, being a theologian and uh, organizer. One of the things that is, is interesting to me uh, is in some of his books, he specifically um, denies the canonical status of uh, the major... Uh, books of the Apocrypha. Specifically, I believe it was 1 Maccabees. And he specifically says, though not canonical, and then he quotes a story from it. Um, Rome likes to say, well, you know, we have this universal tradition, blah, 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 blah. Well, tell that to Pope Gregory the Great. Well, the reason we mention him uh, here, also Gregory the Great is important as a stepping stone in the later full development of the Doctrine of Purgatory. Um, And once again, okay, you're talking around 600 here. It's going to be 840 years later before you have the formal, final, dogmatic definition of Purgatory at the Council of Florence. Um, But you have these steps. And as with so many things in church history, you have different streams that lead into a final position. And this is one of the steps early on. It doesn't mean that Gregory uh, would have even had a concept of what was eventually defined as dogma uh, in, in the middle of the 15th century, but same thing with Augustine. Augustine, when... He allowed the government troops to suppress the Donatists. Had no idea that that would eventually end up in the Spanish Inquisition. Um, But historically, as we look back, we can see the path. But uh, Gregory saw stolen, as was called at the time, Angle children uh, in a slave market in Rome. And they were little, you know, little white cherubs, you know. Um, They weren't as dark as the people in Italy would tend to be. And um, his heart was taken with them. And he found out where they they came from. And so he commissioned a man by the name of, sorry, church history sometimes does repeat names and cause us confusion, Augustine. Augustine. different one, uh, to go to England as a missionary. And when Augustine comes to England, he builds a monastery in a very, very important place called Canterbury. Not Canterburg, which is what I just wrote. I don't know why. My, My right hand went into rebellion. Or as my dad used to say, my tongue got in front of my eye teeth. I couldn't see what I was saying. <clears throat> Anybody else ever heard that one? I think, it's a, I think it's a Midwestern thing, I guess. I don't know. Um, so Augustine builds a monastery in Canterbury. And he wins Ethelbert, king of Kent. And you win the king. And you tend to win the entire realm. 
because once king converts, then everybody else is like, okay. Now, you and I would go, hmm, hmm. That would tend to lead to a fair amount of nominalism. Yes, yes, it would. Yes, it would. But, but, at the same time, while that would tend to lead to nominalism, um, there is also a much different worldview amongst people then. If my king follows this person named Jesus, then I should listen to why I should follow this person named Jesus. So it's real easy for us to go, oh, bleep, ah, bleep. but we're a bunch of individualistic Westerners. And these weren't individual. They're in the West, but the Western culture that we follow post, quote unquote, enlightenment is not what they were living in at that time. So, again, uh, consider, consider that as well. Um, but what happens now is you have the tradition coming from Patrick and Celtic Christianity, and now you've got this much more Roman-based, because Augustine's sent by Gregory, much more Roman-based form. And what would be the major differences? Well, there wouldn't be that much, but uh, the, how, how often have we seen the date of Easter being a controversy? Remember in the early church, Victor and Irenaeus and all that stuff uh, many, many lessons ago now? Uh, well, here we go again. Uh, now, now we're hundreds of years down the road, and there's another controversy over which day you celebrate Easter. Um, most of us don't even know when it's coming anyways uh, today, so we really don't uh, care too much. But So in, uh, in 1663, <coughs> uh, you have... Uh, 16? 663, sorry. In 663, you have the Council of Whitby, which is basically over this uh, competition uh, between Celtic Christianity and Roman Christianity, and the Celts basically lose, and they pull out of England. And they go back to, they go back to uh, Ireland, or I suppose there's still bastions up in Scotland as, uh, as well. And so this is some of the background uh, to what's going on uh, in, in England, Ireland, and Scotland at this point in time, which, of course, becomes so much a center of our attention at, at later periods of time. Now, around this time, we also have expansion into uh, the area of modern-day Deutschland, Germany. Uh, there had already been... Uh, Missionaries that had gone up into this area in the middle 4th century who were Aryan. And so uh, there will always be an issue uh, because the Aryans basically got there first. And Aryan as in Arius, as in denying the deity of Christ. But <clears throat> this area was primarily inhabited by Druids, who were pagans by nature. Uh, if, you, if you want to see a modern representation of what they looked like, uh, if you've seen the movie uh, Gladiator, uh, in the opening scene, the Romans are taking on this uh, Germanic tribe, and uh, they're scary-looking dudes. And uh, that would sort of be the modern-day representation. Uh, they worshipped nature, uh, especially as it was seen in trees, and especially in oaks. Oak trees were extremely um, powerful in their representation of the natural forces. And so we have a man by the name of Boniface. Boniface. Uh, 680 to 754. I saw, I didn't take a picture of it, but at one of the many places we visited in uh, Germany two weeks ago, I noticed a uh, painting. Um, it, was one of the er it was earlier on in the trip. I noticed a painting of this incident in history. I might have taken a picture of it, now I think about it. 
I'll have to look. Um, but uh, it commemorated this particular incident. Uh, Boniface applied to the Pope for authority to go to the Germans as a missionary. Uh, he was sent in 718. Uh, he gets there and he finds, you know, he, he starts to understand uh, Druid theology. And uh, he adopts the missionary methodology of power. Um, now, Boniface is today used as an example of uh, imperialism, uh, insensitivity of Christianity, all sorts of things like that. He's considered to be somewhat of a bad guy. Because um, what he did is he, he finds out that they have a particular locus of worship of a particular tree, the oak at Geismar. The oak at Geismar. Um, all right. Oak at Geismar. And so he decides to demonstrate the superiority of the... Because the Druids, you know, it's, it's power. Uh, it's a competition of, of deities. And so um, this is a very holy place, the Druids. And so uh, he goes there. And I don't know if everybody was, you know, off at a soccer game or just what uh, that allowed him to do this. But he goes to the oak at Geismar and he cuts the thing down. There must not have been anybody around, because I would assume if there are people standing around, they would have probably stopped him from, from doing this. But uh, he just takes big old axe, and um, he cuts down the oak of Geismar. I'm sure in the name of Jesus. Um, and uh, basically says, my God's more powerful than your God. And he was, uh, as a result, elevated the archbishopric. Now, History doesn't tell us exactly how successful he was as far as converting Druids, but uh, evidently if he was elevated to archbishopric, there must have been some positive result of that particular, <coughs> that particular event. Now, it is interesting that there was a British missionary who helped Boniface, and her name was Leoba. She died in 779. That's an I there, L-I-O-B-A. Um, she was sent to a nunnery where she met Mother Teta, who taught her to read. She was renowned for her learning, mastering Latin and French as well. Uh, it was said that she was never without a book except at prayers or when asleep. Uh, so here is a, a woman missionary in the 8th century, uh, famed for her, uh, her learning, uh, and certainly a vi violation of the standard no one could read at the time uh, idea. Though at this period of time already, given the decline of Roman schools after the fall of Rome, uh, <clears throat> much of literacy was focused in, um, in the church, in monasteries, nunneries, um, places like that. That's where much of the learning is now uh, focused at this particular period in time. Well, after the fall of the empire in the West, you basically have, the Roman Empire in the West, you basically have a tremendous amount of uh, confusion, and so what happens over time is um, you're, you're going to have invasions, you're going to have movements of peoples, you're going to have kingdoms that are come together and create small little empires, and they're going to rise and fall, and there's going to be a lot of warfare going on. Um, it, and, and this takes place for, for quite some period of time. 
around the beginning of the 6th century, we have a man by the name of Clovis, uh, who is a Germanic chieftain who invaded Gaul in the late 400s. And he founded what is called, and this is important for no other reason that when you read a lot of um, fiction today, uh, I think Dan Brown picked up on this stuff in the Da Vinci Code and all. These guys end up popping up all the time. And so if you missed this part in school, now's your chance to get back on speed. But uh, Clovis founds the Merovingian dynasty. Merovingian. That's just... Can't even spell it right, but it sounds so good. Merovingian dynasty. Or the kingdom of the Franks. Um, and uh, Clovis's wife, Clotilda. What a name. I love it, Clotilda. I, I say we start, a, you know, let's start a movement to start using early medieval names again, you know, with our next generation of kids. Clotilda. Yeah. Clotilda, there you go. Hey, that, you two, you're a historian. So, there, I, I mean... We were already saying Leoba's nice. Leoba's nice. Clotilda. I'm, Clotilda, mm, pushing it a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like a, like a 1982 East German... Olympian or something, Clotilda. Um, some of you are not old enough to know why I just did that, but that's okay. Uh, she converted to Christianity, and Clovis followed her in 496. Um, now, as often happens, uh, for example, this happened in, um, in the Disney movie Brave. <laughs> um, he divided his kingdom among, amongst three inept sons. Uh, maybe that's where the story came from. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, if you have little kids, you've seen that uh, Disney movie. Um, I love it, of course, because it's you know, filled with Scottish accents. But um, um, the, a man by the name of Pepin of Heristal. Pepin of Heristal who was the um, mayor of the palace, took advantage of this and basically took over for himself, given that Clovis's sons were bozos. Um, that's a technical historical term, bozo. Uh, I'm sure you've probably done some papers on bozoism in early medieval uh, history. Um, <laughs> and he becomes the founder of what is called the Carolingian, Carolingian, Carolingian dynasty. Um, <clears throat> Pepin had close connections with the Roman Church, and what's very important is that he had an illegitimate son, and. You need to know who this guy was uh, because I, I mentioned him really quickly in passing in the introduction on the Islamic section. Yeah, his uh, illegitimate son's name is Charles Martel. And Martel means hammer. Charles the Hammer. Sounds like a WW. Well, it used to be WWF, and then the wildlife people messed it all up. So I don't know what it is now. But it uh, sounds like a professional wrestler. But why is uh, Charles important? Well, Charles Martel becomes king in 714. And big date in history is 732. I even made it big. See how big I made that? 732. Why is that important? Uh, because that 
is when he leads his forces and defeats the Muslims at the Battle of Tours, which stops, which ends the century of Islamic expansion. Because remember, Muhammad dies in 632, and Islam expands, 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 expands for 100 years. And then pretty much exactly 100 years later, at the Battle of Tours, Charles Martel turns them back and begins the process of, and it takes hundreds of years, but driving uh, the Muslims back down out of France, into Spain, and eventually out of there as well. Um, That's where you get the Moors and all the rest of that story that you're probably familiar with. So that's where the 100 years ends, and Charles the Hammer uh, is the man that uh, leads them in their defeat of the Muslims at the Battle of uh, Tours. Uh, He is succeeded by a man named Pepin the Short. I don't make the names up, folks. They just... uh, who took the name the King of the Franks. And Pepin the Short isn't all that important, except that, uh, I guess I should write him here, even though we're running out of space here. Uh, Pepin the Short. But it's Pepin the Short's son that is uh, is important, and certainly a name of someone you've heard before. And his son's name, you cannot see behind this. Uh, So I'm going to have to assume that you have written all this down before uh, because we're going to have to get rid of it here. If you're a slow writer, you're going, oh, no. But if you're that slow, well, sorry. And Pepin the Short's son is named Charlemagne. And Charlemagne's dates are 742 to 814. I said 742, and I wrote, nah, nah, nah. just getting my, my fingers going faster in my brain, which isn't difficult to do. Charles the Great, Charlemagne, he had uh, long white hair from his youth. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can you, be, can you imagine? It's sort of, like, sort of like one of the elves, you know, in, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in Lord of the Rings. He had long white hair from his youth was nearly seven feet tall. That always helps if you want to be king. You know, when you can look down on everybody, uh, that that sort of helps too. Uh, Tremendous athlete, star of the NBA, obviously. Uh, Very pious, quite a scholar, loved literature. His capital city was Aachen, which became a almost renaissance area at that point in time. He doubled the size of his kingdom during his reign. Uh, He drove out the Lombards from Italy in aid to the Pope in 800. And as a result, the Pope then crowned Charlemagne Emperor of the Romans. Now, what's really interesting, and I don't know if you've heard anything that contradicts this, but he was so popular, and it was recognized that no one who would take over from him would ever be as great as he was. Um, So when he died, they left his body on the throne for 100 years. Interesting non-form of burial. Um, And I would imagine he probably didn't look all that great after just a matter of weeks. But um, yeah, yeah. and I don't know if about you, but if I was like his successor, that would sort of bum me out a little bit. You know, I would just automatically feel somewhat slighted uh, at that point. But there you go. Uh, yes, sir. A really big date in the history of the papacy, the fact that the Pope could claim authority to crown somebody emperor. Yeah, uh, the problem is that this is right toward the beginning of the pornocracy. So. The, the papacy is going to go into a, trim, into a 
tailspin decline over the next couple hundred years. So people might look back on that later on, and it's going to come out of the pornocracy and shoot for the stars before it goes back down again. Um, but yeah, I mean, people are going to look back on that and say, see, he did this, he did that. This is probably around the same, you know, same time when the forgeries are being made and stuff like that. So, yeah. But we're going to see a total tanking of the papacy here over the next couple hundred years in what's called the pornocracy. You can guess what that means if it's called the pornocracy. Uh, pretty bad in Rome. Uh, really, really is. Now, we're out of time, but we will pick up with Charlemagne because he introduces, uh, institutes what's called the Carolingian Renaissance, which is very important in maintaining a lot of our historical records and works of literature. and It's a, it's a bright spot in the middle of a dark period uh, in the centuries after uh, the, fall of, uh, the fall of Rome, but something that we should know about, and it's important in having maintained stuff for us even to this day. Okay? All right, let's close our time with the word of prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for this opportunity uh, to think back on what has happened in history. And we recognize sometimes, Lord, we need to look at uh, just simply events in history so we have a context to be able to consider your movements in uh, guiding your people and the progress of the gospel in this world. Uh, We ask that we would uh, go into this service with hearts desirous of hearing from your truth and being made better servants of yours. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.